Everybody knows Seth. Everybody loves Seth. Uh, Seth Hall is has been around the Bro Project for uh, for decades. Um, I think it's been decades, um, fifteen years. Um, Seth is now the chief evangelist at Corelight, uh, and Seth is going to talk about the work that he did in redoing the DHCP analyzer uh, and the scripts in Bro uh, 2.6. So take it away, Seth. Thanks, Keith. All right, it works. Hi. Uh, so I figured I'd kind of start, uh, start by answering the question, like, why was this work done? There, there was not really a big call from the community to to work on the DHCP analyzer in, um, in, in the 2.6 release. So I figured I'd start at the beginning. The reason that I started on it was someone that goes by Mr. Click filed a merge request on GitHub. So if whoever that person is is here, thank you for, for doing work on the analyzer. It's definitely interesting to have people around that are willing to spend time on stuff. The problem was the DHCP log had, was sort of being designed in this way that was guiding it down a path that like, I, I didn't think was really great. Um, it was just no one had really spent time on the output of, the D, of DHCP to say, well, what, what is it? How do you use it? And what's it look like? And what's, what's sort of the, the mindset applied to the log? And so I made sure that everything this person had contributed was represented in the new code, but what I set off on was to say, I don't want to push the analyzer further down this path. Let's kind of back up and redo it and make something that is maybe a little more useful for incident response. So what this person had done, because you probably can't see it, they had added several uh, DHCP option types, parameter request list, renewal time, rebinding time, client identifier. So they'd added all these and then created a, um, uh, just extended the logs a little bit. So the biggest thing was the log wasn't great. It was, the log was purely based on DHCP ACK messages. So a server, so a client might say inform or discover and all the stuff, none of the data that it sent there was represented in the log in any way. The only time you ever saw a log entry was the a DHCP server would say ACK then you would get a log entry, and it only had data from that. So one of the biggest problems that we had struggled with uh, for years was everyone was like, I need the MAC address and the IP address tied together in the DHCP log, and going based on ACK messages, you couldn't do that. The problem, and why, partly why that hadn't been tackled before, is the way that DHCP works is difficult to deal with. So you have to do load balancing in Bro in many cases. So you balance traffic across a series of hosts, and DHCP is a, is a mix of broadcast and unicast, and it doesn't load balance. There's no connection created. It's just sort of packets spewed out onto the network, and uh, it, it just becomes a nightmare for that. So, um, oops, not ready. So that was, you know, that, that was one of the, the things that we needed to make sure that we addressed uh, re redoing this stuff, was to, to get that fixed so that no one really had to think about it. You would just run bro and it worked correctly. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how I designed the, the, my approach to designing the, uh, the changes that came. I, I went with a somewhat, so this probably applies to like 5% of the people here, but I thought I'd talk about it. I went with a kind of novel bin pack structure, and bin pack is the binary protocol analyzer compiler, and as of today, it's still how many like, new analyzers are being written in Bro. It's a specification language where you can say how things are parsed. I went with this model for DHCP options where they're not all, in, this top block shows the the base, like, essentially switch statement where you're like, okay, now there's a bunch of different options you're going to parse. But I went with this model that separated that. So the bottom section has, it refines that case. So, like, we're sort of, it's a little more plug-in oriented where it's, instead of having, like, a bunch of stuff here and be like, here's the switches, and they pass off to all these different structures, they could be organized a little bit better. Anyway, it's kind of a novel bin pack structure that is, was built into bin pack years ago, but not really widely used. I also wanted to simplify the event structure a lot, because there was no real reason to have it broken out the way that it was originally years and years ago. So there was someone I imagine at the International Computer Science Institute, or ICSI, 
uh, I imagine this person was probably an intern there or something, and they had created this structure with events named DHCP discover, DHCP offer, request, so on. But due to the way that DHCP works, there's really like one message type and then options. And so having all of these broken out, they were all like the same kind of, but different. They were just kind of goofy to work with. So I reduced it all into a single event called DHCP message. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But the problem, because of the load balancing, right? So now you've got your workers, and you've got like DHCP discover for this one sort of DHCP conversation goes to the worker over there on the left. Then the server replies and says, hey, I'm going to offer you something. But because that's like not broadcast and it's unicast, it's a different connection as far as Bro is concerned and as far as like basically all load balancers are concerned. And that packet goes to the worker at the end. So you end up with this case where you've got packets going to the wrong place and things don't work. So there is this meta event called DHCP aggregate messages that essentially takes all the DHCP messages and centralizes them back to the manager. And then it gives the manager the opportunity to say, OK, I know the transaction ID. I can tie these together through transaction ID and come up with a uh, sensible log. So this is where I really wanted to talk about the new DHCP log. Um, the old one was just saying DHCP ACK, and it logged some data out of the ACK. The new one really takes into this idea of a, of a life cycle of sort of, you know, because you know, I think if pretty much everyone here thinks about it, you probably are like, well, yeah, there's some interaction. Client says something, server says something, client says something, you know, there's, there's this kind of back and forth interaction. The new log takes that into account and has this notion of like a conversation. So each log entry is like a conversation. So a very normal, like this is not the only way that uh, DHCP conversations can go, but a very normal conversation, something shows up on the network and says, discover, just broadcasts the network, like, hey, is there a DHCP server here? And then a, client, a, a server comes back, and it may do unicast or it may do broadcast. It comes back and says, here's an offer on an address, and then the client requests that address, and the server says, ack. So now we've actually pulled data from four different DHCP messages and not just that one, which is what the old one was. And the important thing is this whole conversation ends up as a single log entry. So now I don't, I'm going to guess people can't see that. Oh, I wonder if this works. Oh, it does. I know. You would not know it's uh, 2018. Um, very nice, actually. So it, it's, in some ways, it's got some similarities to a lot of other logs. This is not quite all the fields that are in, this, in the log, but it's, it's many of them. It has a timestamp field, which is when the first message of the conversation was seen. Um, it, the next field is UIDs, and this is because there's multiple connections. So you have to say, you have to accept that Bro has analyzed this as multiple connections. So you look in your, um, in your con log, and you actually have to find all these different connections. Because it wasn't just like a single you know, established TCP connection, request, reply, request, reply, like you would hope. So anyway, there's multiple UIDs. It has, it, this, is, this is one field. These, these next two fields are ones that I'm still a little Still going back and forth on a little bit. I think they're good, but I, I'm not totally sure. And one, one thing I would like to point out before I talk about these, if anyone has, like, um, feel free to, to say something on the mailing list or something. If you don't like the structure of the logs or something, like, don't ever assume anything is sort of finished, right? It's, it's always changing. There's always the willingness to uh, recognize other scenarios that weren't considered and, and adapt those into the log. But client adder and server adder, what they are is essentially um, synthesized fields. Because there's this back and forth, and there's like the client starts out with no address. It's like, hey, I'm a MAC address, and I'm just saying, hey, would someone give me an address? And, or, or it may tell the network and say, hey, if anyone's out there, I would like address 1.2.3.4. And then a DHCP server might come back and say, no. That address won't be the client address, because that, that was never like a, an address that there was like agreement, like, yes, you're good to use that address, go ahead. So that won't show up as a client address. But what you may have is someone says, I want this, I want to be 1.2.3.4. The server comes back and says, no, 
and the client goes, well, what can I have? And then the server's like, you could have this address. And then the server client goes, I want that address. And the server goes, now you're good. And that's the address that'll show up there. So that field is a little composite. I mean, these two fields are, are a little composite. Server adder is the same way. Um, it's actually documented, so like the documentation for the field sort of lays out specifically what these mean. But uh, the server address is a little complicated too because in DHCP you can have DHCP relays. So in that case you're like, well, is the relay the server or is the server the server? Did we see the server request or did we only see the relay? So the whole thing gets, gets really tricky. Some of this may slightly change over time still as people point out um, you know, edge cases where maybe this is not perfect. And here's where, this is what a lot of people wanted, the MAC address is tied together with the IP address. So yay, that was, all this work led to, to that. It's not very exciting, but it is exciting at the same time. And then um, you kind of get down into some of these like DHCP options, and these were things that I kind of just dug through. And I'm gonna talk about some of these a little bit more in a minute, but there's things like host name, which is, uh, uh, it's all documented in the logs themselves, but the, the host name is sent by the client, Client FD, FQD, FQDN is sent by the client. I'll talk about that more in a minute. And then you have like requested adder. So it, it could be that like if someone, if a host says, hey, I'd like 1.2.3.4, it'll show up there because it could have requested that address. But then there's another, there's another field that doesn't show up in this log called server message. And you'll see this where a server comes back and says, you know, that address is not an available range or something like that. Um, and then assigned address. So you can see like the, the client requested that address, the server said, yep, you're good to use that address. And then you've got um, lease time, so a thousand, I hope I documented that, it's either seconds or minutes, probably minutes. I don't really know. <laughs> it's probably documented. Um, oh no, actually it's probably gonna be seconds, because internally in Bro that's a time, so that's seconds. Uh, message types, so this, one, and this one to me was a little interesting because this really shows you the flow of that conversation. So this one you can look at and see, that's a vector too, so those, are, those fields are ordered, like that's, that's, not just, uh, that's not just an array. Or it's not like, it's just a jumbled set of things. So you can see when Bro was looking at it, it's all a discover message, it's all an offer message, it's all a request message, it's all an ACK message. The implicit assumption here also is Bro basically sits and waits. It's configurable, but by default, it sits and waits for 30 seconds to say, is that all? Because sometimes, you, I've seen stuff before, you'll have discover, offer, request, ack, 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 it just goes, keeps going on, you're like, what the hell? I mean, it just, it doesn't stop. But it's interesting to see that, and it means that if you see ack, 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 and it just goes on, that it kept doing that. That, like, and there was never a period of time where that transaction ID, which is how DHCP sort of ties everything together, where that transaction ID like wasn't used anymore. Yes, Pat? Are you not capturing NACs when you're calling We are, we, NACs are captured. This one doesn't have a NAC, so th this is just a one single example. But yeah, there are NACs also. So the NAC would be if you request 1.2.3.4 and the server says, nope, that ends up being a NAC. And it'll have a server message. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that got added, that, that is added in here is duration. So this is, you know that between the time from that initial discover request until the final ACK request from the server, it was a tenth of a second. Which is kind of interesting. I mean, I, I, a lot of times uh, duration ends up being sort of interesting from a, from a response perspective because I've seen some of these in various um, PCAPs I've looked at it will have significantly longer durations and it starts to make you wonder about like DHCP server performance or client behavior. It's just, it's a million new directions to look into because suddenly you're like, why did it take a long time or why did it take no time? But it, the, this is the kind of log I've always found that you look at a single log like this and, and you know, it's kind of like, okay, it makes sense, whatever. But then you look at 10 million of these logs and you start having all these thoughts and things you might want to get answered and you start digging through and finding stuff. So I have a few regrets and mistakes. I blindly changed the DHCP event structure and I broke one of my own scripts and broke some other scripts people had distributed. Um, thank you, Vlad. <laughs> I thought it was you, there you are. I, uh, I, thought it was, uh, I thought it was you that did it and I went through and made sure that it was this morning. Um, 
Uh, Vlad went in and wrote a compatibility script that is, that is in Bro, so down at the bottom, the load protocols DHCP deprecated events. So if anyone has a DHCP script that does not work in Bro 2.6, you can either update it to work with the new structures, or you can add that line and it'll start working again. And the other one is, um, I got, I, I spent quite a while working on DHCP, and I got kind of exhausted by the end, and DHCP, and DHCP v6 is a completely different protocol, and uh, I, I just got tired and didn't work on it. So unfortunately, I didn't add DHCP v6, but I would have loved to have added that just for completeness. But anyway, we have fun stuff. So my talk might be a little shorter right on time. Maybe. Um, there is an option in DHCP where the server can be like, hey, you, can you forward IP traffic? I would love if you'd do that. <laughs> so I'll just read. You probably can't see. This option specifies whether the client should configure its IP layer for packet forwarding. No idea. I've, I have no idea why that was added, because I thought maybe uh, something would explain it, and it, it didn't really. There, there's two values. This may not be a surprise. Disable IP forwarding and enable IP forwarding. Um, I don't know why they added that, but I thought it was kind of funny, and I did find evidence in a PCAP that I had where a server set this. Um, I think they set it to zero to disable IP forwarding, but it was... Surprised me to see it at all, because I figured this would be one of those, like, you know, just totally unused, dead things. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was in a PCAP. I, when I was implementing options, because there's, there's tons of options, 90% of them are completely not present and irrelevant. But uh, I went through a bunch of PCAPs that I had, did a bunch of searching on the Internet, and found other PCAPs. I basically implemented anything I could find. Like, if a client sent the option or a server sent the option, I was like, whatever, I'll implement it. So there's a lot of stuff. This, this, for instance, doesn't show up in the log. So someone might want to write a script that's like, let's just, I just want to know if that option's set. And you could like, write that script pretty easily to find out on your network if that option is ever set. I do have to say, though, I really love the idea of having a server that's telling everything to turn on IP forwarding, and you basically get like a full mesh network where you could just send IP packets anywhere on the local network, and they all forward for you. I kind of like that. It's the opposite of a lot of corporate networks, where you send IP packets and nothing will forward for you. There's no, no gateway that works. Uh, this one, this one is in, um, in the log. It was the one that I showed earlier. It's uh, the client FQDN option. It's basically the other half. <laughs> Very loud. <laughs> Um, it's basically the other half of uh, dynamic DNS. So you, you're like, hey, network, I think my name is whatever, foobar.com. That's what I'm pretty sure my name is. I'd love if you could update the pointer record. And um, it's interesting because I get it from a functionality perspective. The, the, the people that implemented this were like, well, that's nice because the network the DHCP server can update the pointer record, and then you can go off and do dynamic DNS, and you know, everything is happy. But from an incident responder perspective, they just told you that someone from Booz Allen Hamilton's on your network. Or if you're sitting on a plane, someone from, I guess Microsoft, uh, IBM is probably Watson.com, someone from IBM is on your plane, and now you know where they are, and you can just poke at them. But I, I'm not sure that they really thought through that completely, that this was like blind, like blatantly, because these are all broadcast packets anyway. Everybody on the network explicitly gets them. There's no like getting around it. But yeah, there, there's several, a number of hosts that are configured to do dynamic DNS stuff. It seems to all be like corporate laptops and stuff, but they try to do dynamic DNS and they want their pointer record updated. And they will just say where they're from. And it's kind of cool too, just to be able to get that. So the last, the last one I wanted to talk about real quick was auto proxy config option. Uh, this is an alternate. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the DNS version of WPAD, which is what this expired RFC is for. I don't even know if there is a valid RFC for it. But uh, a lot of people are familiar with, like, you know, you'll see WPAD.whatever.com or something like that for DNS. 
But there's another side to it for doing auto proxy discovery in DHCP. The funny part is if your network is not protected from DHCP spoofing, which how many networks are protected from DHCP spoofing? Not a whole lot. You just send this thing and you'd be like, I want you to send all your web stuff over here. So it kind of had the same feel as that IP forwarding one. And this one's also not in the log because I couldn't find a lot of evidence of this being used, but you'll see it mostly on corporate networks and stuff where they're, they want to do that. I, and I don't even know. Maybe this isn't even broadly used. I have no idea. But it is, it is there, and Bro does parse it and put it out. So are there any questions or anything anybody wants to talk about? We got five minutes or so, seven minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, yeah, this, this was something, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat, I'm sorry. Uh, she was asking about um, basically the performance of this, th this, this structure. Um, I'm hoping over the next few releases that we have a better model for doing this in a scalable way. Um, it's not there right now, and it just kind of goes to one node. Uh, I'm curious, so actually this will be my plea uh, to, if, if anyone does find problems with this, I would love to hear, because like, th that, is, that was a concern. When I went with this architecture, I was pretty concerned, but I don't know of that many people that are running DHCP infrastructures that are so large that that's gonna cause a problem, but certainly a potential. Is it the same manager that is managing the log as well? Uh, so there, there's a, the, the question was, uh, is it the same manager that's managing the logs? Most people, and you can configure this, um, the manager will handle the logs, and yes, it would be in that case, but since Bro 2.5, there has been a separate logger node, so a lot of people split the logs out, because then it really reduces the load on the manager so that it can do stuff. Uh, the logs are such a heavy load in so many cases that it, like, you shift that off somewhere else and it frees up the manager. I hope that this will get us through 2.6, this, this structure, but who knows. Was, was there another question? Hey. So the question was, uh, have you thought about, have I thought about ask, adding the transaction ID into the log? I'm surprised I didn't. <laughs> uh, would that be useful? Yeah. Uh, you could probably add that in. I think that could be an add-on script, at least for 2.6, where that could be add, tacked onto the log. Um, I think I left it out because, sorry? Keith has pointed out it would be a great bro package. Uh, unfortunately, one of those bro packages that, uh, if it does turn out to be super useful, we'll probably just roll it into the log eventually. But. Um, yeah, I, I could see it being useful. I, I, this was one of the things, like, I just sat and thought about this stuff a lot and talked to a few people, and, um, yeah, th this is why I was asking earlier. I fully expect that there's some, there's some aspects of this log that are just not quite right yet. But, that's, you know, the logs are never going to be, like, done. So they'll change over time. But that's a good question. Are there any other questions? Well, may you all um, broadcast yourselves gleefully onto the network through DHCP. <laughs> <laughs>